everything is woke, and nothing is woke. Let me explain. As I'm writing this, Marvel's new film Guardians Volume 3 dropped the other day, and you know, amazing movie, light spoilers for that film here, but one thing that really caught my eye was the response the film was getting from a certain section of internet users and YouTube channels. You know the ones I'm talking about. You see, now, a couple of months after Guardians 3 was the object du jour of their two minutes hate because the posters had Nebula, a female alien character, wearing a t-shirt instead of, I don't know, a push-up bra under a crop top, and this meant that the film was trying to subversively destroy gender roles. Now, that narrative's been flipped. A lot of those same guys have been covering the film's release from the opposite angle, claiming Guardians 3 is non-woke, anti-woke even, that it's, what, the last real Marvel project, a final, non-agenda-pushing volley from exiting director James Gunn, blah blah blah. And that's interesting, right? What's going on here that those decrying a piece of woke trash would pull such a 180? Nebula looks like this in the film too, the thing they latched onto is still there. And if it was so self-evidently a huge issue, how can we reconcile that with this new anti-woke framing? Where are the boundaries of wokeness, both within this film and pop culture more widely? How firm, how changeable are they? And what can testing these boundaries, following this thread, tell us about the culture of anti-wokeness more widely? Let's have a go at finding out, yeah? Look, let's start with Guardians. So yeah, it's it's not woke anymore, you guys. I think this new framing's due to, what, the fact that the main protagonists are white men or played by white men, that they don't get beaten up by women ever, and because some of the critics didn't like it, and they're obviously in on the woke agenda. I think those are the reasons. If I've missed something there, please do fill me in in the comments. But hold on. In as much as any film is woke, which, yeah, big asterisk there, Guardians 3 is woke. There's the aforementioned superficially woke elements, like Nebula, the alien cyborg, wearing a t-shirt instead of breasting boobily the whole time, but there's also, you know, the story. Now, as we've discussed previously on this channel, in 2023, woke doesn't really mean anything specific anymore. It now refers to an ill-defined, sometimes contradictory cluster of meanings, and arguably the whole point of the term's continued usage is to obscure that fact, to blur those lines, to launder right-wing sentiment through this act of distortion. But before woke became this empty signifier, before reactionaries co-opted the term, it referred primarily to being aware of cis systemic injustices. And if you passed out for, like, the whole second act, I could maybe see how this doesn't seem relevant to Guardians 3, but if you did watch the whole film, it is kind of clearly woke in that original sense. Jesse Gender made a tweet a while back noting the political underpinnings of the film's counter-Earth sequence, and just to expand on that quickly, one of the high evolutionary's flaws here is a sort of aristocratic belief in intrinsic, biological quality as the sole determinant of success in life. Nature over nurture, nature instead of nurture, is his whole thing. He copied the America of the 70s to build his perfect world, replacing the people because he thought the people were the problem, only for his homebrew, perfected humanity to develop those same issues. We see snatches of crime and poverty on the Guardian's drive through of his little city skyline's LARP. The film's point here is very clear. Biology isn't the issue. Individual bad apples don't cause this stuff. It's the systems they're acting within, which on a mass scale incentivize certain actions, disincentivize others, block off people's options, yada yada yada, and that's one of the reasons the high evolutionary is wrong, is a bad guy, a guy who deserved to get his face scratched off. You could very easily follow that thread across the rest of the movie. The idea that individual quality, design or breeding don't lead to success and happiness, that good, caring systems do, but that's getting beyond the scope of this video. Suffice it to say, while these elements of the film do qualify as woke in that pre-2016 AAVE-derived meaning of the word, from the looks of things, those elements have not made Guardian's 2023 online reactionary woke. Finally! A great Marvel movie without a bunch of woke bullshit politics in it! Finally a happy fan! Think of a happy fan! Hey! How are ya? Without woke identity politics and all this other shit staring you in the face! Hi! I'm woke politics! 
Nebula's t-shirt did, mind you, but now it isn't anymore, because, well, why exactly? Interestingly, the Mario movie's disputed wokeness followed a similar pattern. The fact that Peach was wearing trousers at one point in the promotional materials, that is, her well-known karting outfit we've all seen a thousand times before, led to a lot of the usual suspects complaining about the, I don't know, women in trousers agenda. Together, we... Mm. What's wrong, Chad? I, I, I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts. You don't have a whip out of you know pants and wah, halberd and Smash Bros. Yeah. Well, they're still more. taking away the femininity of a Peach. Peach. Yeah. Princess Peach. Yeah. We've given her pants. After the film came out, of course, its place in the narrative changed. The Mario movie became anti woke also, necessitating some frankly embarrassing backpedaling. This is the part where she tries to say, what What are you talking about, Peach? You, you know, wearing pants, she, she's wearing pants. D is she aware that this is us reacting to the trailer and we don't have that context? Because when we have that context, did we criticize her wearing No, we didn't, it makes perfect sense she's wearing pants, not a problem at all. But in the trailer, we didn't know that. It actually looked like they might've been removing the dress entirely, or at least most often. So oh my God, okay. Bowser is coming. No problem. Get it up, get it up. There's a huge universe out there. Whoa. No pressure. In this case, in the case of Guardians, wokeness is at once self-evident, so self-evident that you'll never get a straightforward definition. Woke politics. We all know what they are. And they don't include eugenics or animal cruelty from what... I've understood. I could be wrong. But also collapsible at a moment's notice. Why? How? Well, sadly, there is no canonical answer. No explanation for those flip-flops which would satisfy the wokeness conspiracy's crusty basement-dwelling believers. But it does tell us something. Wokeness is a malleable thing. If Mario, if Guardians 3 can be woke one month and anti-woke the next, then wokeness can't be located within the work. It has to come from outside of it. It has to be projected onto its surface. So let's talk about that process of projection. Sometimes it's straightforward. Sometimes, yes, a character might make wry reference to contemporary politics or discourse. I think I'm a fan of the 21st century. Yeah, don't get your hopes up. We make a mean prosthetic, but uh, fascism is back. I mean, I know socialism is a charged word, but we could learn a lot from these. Yeah. Sometimes a film will include queer affection, and it won't matter that more often than not that queer affection is peripheral. It won't even matter that most of these films treat queer relationships exactly the same as hetero ones. That you could reshoot those home scenes in Eternals, replace Fastos' husband with a woman, and they'd play out more or less identically. Because the reactionary audience is by now convinced that queer existence isn't equal or comparable to straight existence, is less. For the grifter, this is easy mode, but not every suspected woke project will feature a light year kiss. So when they don't, when there is no straightforward woke spotlighting, another tactic is needed. Luckily, such a tactic exists. It's easy, it's flexible, and it gets results. I've made oblique reference to it in the past. I think I called it brain dead symbology in one video or another. But here, now that we're looking directly at it, I'd like to coin a snappier term woke spotting. Woke spotting is laser focused, bad faith interpretation. It's the art of combing through a work to find individual details which can be contorted into support for your own foregone conclusion. At its most basic, it's really just a game of recognizing objects man, woman, family, government, dress, gun, and the positioning of those objects. Woman defeats man, family dominates man, woman rejects dress, government dominates man, in a way that can be read, however, flimsily as pushing the nebulous woke agenda. 
Importantly, how the story frames these objects and positions is largely unimportant. If it happens to line up with the anti-woke narrative, great, but if not, it doesn't matter. All the woke spotting game requires is that those positioned objects be there in some capacity. The already established anti-woke mythology does the rest, does the heavy lifting, substitutes in for framing. For instance, when the Mario trailers were woke spotted, it was observed that, again, in Peach's wardrobe, trousers replaced dress. It didn't matter that Peach was, of course, wearing trousers because she was carting, or that this costuming is included in the film as yet another game reference in a film literally built from them, that context didn't matter. This detail got decontextualized, dragged kicking and screaming into some abstract culture war space, frothing at the mouth about the destruction of traditional gender roles and all that. With real context swapped out for anti-woke mythology, the film's straightforward, sensible decision to put Peach in trousers becomes craven, woke gesturing, at once obvious and subliminal, both a loud, performative gesture and insidious, corruptive messaging. The Captain Marvel film might see our titular heroine talking down to men, and it doesn't matter that from her perspective she's talking to the equivalent of 13th century country bumpkins, it doesn't matter that she's no more cocky than insert list of beloved male protagonists here. No, this becomes read as simply film thinks woman better than man. Similarly, the fact that some bad or dumb men exist in She-Hulk, the fact that at some points female characters are indignant towards male ones, meant obviously that the show was widely taken as woke, agenda-driven misandry. As we've discussed before in a whole video, it doesn't matter that our protagonist's flawed outlook at the show's beginning is explicitly spelled out later on in the show, or that we see plenty of positive male characters, yada yada yada, watch the video linked on screen now for more. No, all that matters is that in this scene, men creep on women, and in this scene, woman disagrees with man, and that's enough to start the outrage farming. That's enough to conjure up the honest-to-god typhoon of She-Hulk hates men. She-Hulk shows the MCU hates you, the viewer. Left-wing values are corrupting and destroying culture, sentiment that followed. It doesn't matter that the narratives which tie this outrage to the text don't hold up under any amount of scrutiny, because they don't need to hold up. They just need to have enough points of contact with the work to support a flimsily built narrative for the length of a YouTube video or so, no matter how much of a stretch it is. And work spotting doesn't always have to be done explicitly. Indeed, if the creator's interested in plausible deniability, sometimes it's better to do this euphemistically, to simply cherry pick a few details, misrepresent them a little, and suggest a problematic positioning. That way, technically, you're not making any allegations, you're just asking very leading questions. Here's a recent example of just this. Also, I can't shake the feeling that the script is doing everything in its power to play down Peter Parker, like it's afraid the audience will somehow start rooting for him over Miles if he's shown to be too capable and confident. The first movie portrayed him as an aging, burned out loser who only redeems himself at the end, while the second film morphs him into a bumbling, hapless father in a pink bathrobe who for some reason keeps taking his baby along on life-threatening adventures despite having a perfectly capable mother at home to look after it. Is this some weird attempt to mock and belittle the Spider-Man? man that most people know and love, who incidentally just happens to be the only straight white man in the entire movie? I don't know man, it just kinda leaves a sour taste in my mouth, that's all. Straight white male is out alphaed by the woke spider people. Sour taste left in mouth. Cherry picked. Agenda suggested. Time to move on. I'm sure there's plenty of other Spider-Verse examples, but I wrote the rest of this video back in May, and look, it's already long enough, so let's get back to it. That is woke spotting, the interpretative trick that allows a piece of media to be marked as a valid target for the conspiratorial, alt-right driven collective hate ceremonies of the anti-woke movement. It's incredibly easy to pull off, and you can do it to practically anything. Let me show you what I mean. The other day, I asked my followers on Twitter for some examples of TV and film that are not considered woke. Not anti-woke, mind, just things which aren't typically considered to be within the purview of this little culture war. 
We're going to look at a few of these suggestions and show how easy it is to project wokeness upon them. One suggestion was friends, which I think is a pretty solid starting point, being essentially the cultural background noise for vast swathes of the Western world around the time of the new millennium. But here's the thing, it's woke. Sometimes men love women, and sometimes men love men. One of the main ongoing storylines in the early seasons results from the fact that Ross's marriage broke down when his wife realised she was political. Sorry, I misspoke. When she realised she was a lesbian. This is something we're introduced to in the very first episode. And you never knew she was a lesbian. <laughs> no, okay? Why does everyone keep fixating on that? And which we go on to follow closely. The ex-wife Carol finds a new partner and marries her, an episode is dedicated to this, and Ross, the poor beta male cuck, even gives his ex-wife away to her new bride. Look, I'm sure you don't need me to break down how this would be framed by your Matt Walsh's and such like if it came out today, but just to make it explicit, using that model of woke spotting outlined above, the objects here are woman, lesbian, and submissive man, the positioning would be woman leave submissive man for lesbian, and the existing anti-woke mythology of Hollywood and TV studios trying to beam radically subversive ideas about gender and sexuality into the idle minds of watchers would do the rest. Friends, then, is just as woke in the co-opted sense as the Mario movie ever was, as Guardians was, as She-Hulk was. But it's not just Friends. You could also look to Seinfeld here, in many ways the yin to Friends yang, which had a whole episode dedicated to telling the audience there's nothing wrong with being gay. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. Not at all. <laughs> but shoving it down our throats a little hard there, don't you think, NBC? And which featured in Elaine a somewhat groundbreaking depiction of a female lead whose story wasn't oriented around finding the one, settling down, and instead constituted a frank, non-judgmental look at modern single life. Well, I'll take three. Three? Yeah. Well, make it ten. <laughs> ten? Twenty sponges should be plenty. Through our woke spotting telescope, though, in Elaine, we see woman reject family, add in her vocal pro-abortion position some spiel about loose sexual morals, and hey presto, you've got the basis for a woke Seinfeld takedown screed. Let's not forget Frasier here, also among those Twitter suggestions, a show focusing on a rich coastal elite embracing a new, decidedly non-nuclear household structure, for which you could make a similar abandonment of traditional values case. But let's leave the 90s sitcoms behind, go wider with this. What other pop cultural touchstones are secretly woke? One reply points out that Judds would hate Alien and Aliens if they came out today, and that is obviously bang on. We'll shortly return to the fact that these films do get a pass these days, but woke spotting is piss easy here. Solo woman defeats immensely homicidal alien that had torn through the rest of the crew, and in the sequel, not only does woman defeat aliens, men, highly trained, outfitted men, fail to. Avatars woke too. Natives good, white men bad. Christ, even Shrek is woke. Shrek is the story of some Antifa hermit successfully dismantling the state's unjust landholding system, but we don't even have to look that deep into it. We can just see that the story ends celebrating the main female character's transformation from classical, ideal feminine beauty to a body type and mode of existence that goes against this, goes against the grain of society's traditional gender stereotypes more widely, and ding ding, woke film alert. Another user suggested No Time to Die, which is a super interesting example because it had a broadly similar reception to that of Guardians 3. Susceptible viewers were whipped up into a frenzy by anti-woke responses to the trailers and promotional materials, only for the narrative to shift after the film's release. The good news is that the movie is nowhere near as bad as those early trailers suggested, which basically painted Bond as a useless, miserable pussy, constantly getting pushed around and berated by his strong, empowered female replacements. To the point that now, in 2023, it can reasonably be brought up as an example of non-woke media. Indeed, it has been read convincingly as a failed attempt to rehabilitate the misogyny inherent to Daniel Craig's Bond, but for our purposes here, to project wokeness onto this film, 
All we have to do is look back to that initial response, which really was woke spotting at its most harebrained. Lashana Lynch's Nomi was, of course, identified as woman of color replacing man, and as more plot details were teased, Bond's devotion to Lea Seydoux's Madeleine Swann, the first female lead to appear across two subsequent Bond films, was taken as woman turns iconic symbolic sigma male into simp. Oi fellas, is it woke to fall in love? So forget about the actual film, forget about the fact that it wasn't really woke in that original sense, that Nomi wasn't the Hollywood agenda replacing Bond with a woman of color, that the temporary inheritance of the 007 codename by her spoke not to the shadowy media impact of Kathleen Kennedy's feminist mind virus, but to the anachronistic undercurrent of No Time to Die, the part of the film that wonders how suited Bond, MI6, Spycraft is to the modern world, how far Britain and its surroundings have changed since Ian Fleming put pen to paper. No, forget all that. With our woke spotting glasses on, all we have to do is mark the object, here black woman and the position at its most superficial, replacing white man, and hey presto, we arrive, as so many did, at the conclusion that the film is woke. That's it. That's the trick. That's the bad faith hermeneutic multi-tool that facilitates the lion's share of this online, laughably transparent culture war bollocks. So what can this methodology tell us about this present wave of online, alt-right-inspired reactionary creators? Well, let's recap. As we've established, wokeness is malleable, it's projected onto the text, it isn't within it, and especially since no real definition of wokeness is ever given, that act of projection has an almost unlimited flexibility. So Marvel is woke, and Friends is woke too, Seinfeld, Frasier, Alien, Shrek, James Bond, everything is woke. Even the things that really aren't too progressive under the surface, they're woke. There is no real connection between the ethos of a film and its wokeness. But that ungroundedness, that flexibility, goes both ways. Also like Guardians, though admittedly to a lesser degree, after No Time to Die came out and people actually got to see that these claims of replacement and filmmaking by quota were overblown and unhinged, the viewership gradually abandoned these convictions of wokeness, stopped clutching their pearls. The amount of post-release videos on No Time to Die's wokeness and failure pales in comparison to more recent targets. The narrative started to become untenable, and those pushing it realized Sound familiar? You know, wearing pants, she, she's wearing pants in the film because she was on the motorbike. Is she aware that this is us reacting to the trailer and we don't have that context? There are a few reasons why this can happen, why these narratives can fall apart. Individually, these reasons are manageable, but multiple at once will overwhelm any would-be woke spotter. For one, a pre-release woke spotted project being loved by general audiences but not by critics puts the reactionary in a tricky position. The critics, after all, are held to be agents of the agenda, and the audience reaction is the only thing you can really trust. They're not being venomed to like or dislike things by Brie Larson and Kathleen Kennedy like all those woke critics. No, they're real honest fans. If they like something and the Hollywood elites over on Rotten Tomatoes don't, persisting with that woke labeling requires a good amount of cognitive dissonance, both on the part of the creator and their audience. Sometimes interviews begin to pose problems, especially if the people behind a given project decide to extend an olive branch or two to the fans, clarify they're not trying to be woke honest. The biggest fly in the ointment, though, is just success. One of the key tenets of the anti-woke mythology is get woke, go broke. And the centrality of this idea is obvious from the amount of box office tracking videos these chuds pump out. So if a film or a show they'd woke spotted is an obvious success, financially or statistically, things get difficult. And the easy way out is to recant on that woke spotting, to claim you'd got it wrong, that this one isn't woke actually. This way, the blessed mantra of get woke, go broke is preserved. 
pulling off that U-turn might make you look a bit silly, but it is the only real choice you have. We talked above about the way that the anti-woke mythology does the heavy lifting here, how it's the accelerant that transforms banal observations about women doing things in media into telltale signs of sinister leftist propaganda, but that power does have a drawback, because as a result, no one chud is bigger than the collective mythology. If any of these reactionary creators were to try and question or modify the mythology, the sacred doctrines of anti-fandom, most of their viewers would just tune out. There are always plenty of other, non-heretical chud channels to choose from, after all. They'd start catching flack on Twitter, they'd stop getting invites to Friday Night Tights, the grift would dry up. The reactionaries know this, know that sticking to the script, together, benefits everyone. And if that means every now and then one of them has to babble out an embarrassing mea culpa, then so be it. That's how powerful, how beneficial this mythology is, but it does have its limits. Let's get back to Alien. Why isn't that woke? Put simply, anti-wokeness didn't start soon enough. The consensus that, you know, alien equals good is too entrenched. Any reactionary who'd try to claim otherwise would look like a fool, and the Emperor's new clothes would be seen by all. Put less simply, like so many of the right-wing narratives which inspired anti-wokeness, the mythology relies heavily on the good old days, the idea that today's culture is fallen, that things used to be better before those new, progressive values came about. The date of this fall into wokeness is flexible. Often it's supposed to have occurred around the release of the Ghostbusters reboot, or The Last Jedi, maybe Avengers Endgame, in order to piggyback on existing fan negativity. Sometimes the critical period is Gamergate, but it's always recent, always in the last 20 or so years. Popular cinema in the 20th century is always the good, representing the non-woke gold standard we're supposed to yearn for a revival of. Why is that the case? Part of it's nostalgia. For marks of a certain age, those 80s or 90s classics were childhood viewing, and thus acquire a rose-tinted aura in retrospect. In addition, time has a sieve-like effect on culture. The best bits are remembered, the worst are not. In 30 years, we'll remember the Avengers. Divergent, not so much. It also has to do with the fact that anti-wokeness is the nerd wing of the culture war. In these spaces, the original Star Wars, Alien, Terminator, Predator films, those older Star Trek shows, and so on, these are canonical works, the foundations of modern nerd culture. And that's been the case for decades, long before YouTube ever played host to any creators railing against the message. But there is, of course, a difficulty here, and we've already seen it. If the Aliens films came out today, the Chuds would hate them. If the Terminator films came out today, the Chuds would hate them. By the same ticket that today's hot-button female-led projects are woke, these are woke. The presence of that dastardly agenda, wokeness, in this modern reactionary sense is manufactured and projected onto all superficially applicable surfaces alike. And if they did it to No Time To Die, they'd have done it to Alien. To get away from this, today's reactionaries and their viewers will exhort, in ruthlessly meaningless terms, how those were different, those weren't politically motivated, those women weren't forced in, or they'll just avoid the topic altogether. But to anyone who hasn't drank the Kool-Aid, or isn't trying to make a quick buck from outrage farming on the algorithm, the mismatch here, the cognitive dissonance, is clear. He may not be parading through the city, but the Emperor is still wearing those new clothes. And every now and then, he slips up, stands too near a window, and more people see. The reactionary grift, the mythology of wokeness it bolsters, which in turn bolsters it, these ludicrous doctrines of anti-fandom do not make sense. The basis is not reason or logic, it's emotion and faith. And every one of these mismatches, of these public moments of cognitive dissonance, these aliens, these peaches trousers incidents, these guardians U-turns, reveals this, pulls the curtain back momentarily. And that isn't always enough. Some people are deep enough into this cult, have grown so attached to Mr. Bones' wild ride that they'll rationalize practically anything. But lots aren't, not yet. 
And every time a grifter slips up, more people realize that it's all a big, greasy ball of shit, that the Emperor is stark balls out naked, that if everything can be made woke, then nothing really is. Thank you for watching, smash that godforsaken like button, special thank you to all my Patreon supporters on screen now, especially Daniel Goldhorn, Heather Long, Ryan Emily, and Weirdy Beardy. Please do consider joining up on any tier if you'd like to help support the channel. And that's it, we're done. I'm gonna go and look at pictures of dogs or something.